Okay. All right. Okay. Um, good, mo good, good evening everybody. Makasaysayang gabi po sa ating lahat. Um, I hope I can speak in Filipino as well. Uh, salamat po. A question, um, first of all, I would like to ask you first, um, if you, what it is that you have heard about Senator Nino Yakino. I guess that's, that's a good question to start. What are your perceptions? What were the things that were told to you? Uh, so maybe we can address them in the talk, but uh, I, I would also like to hear from you. Anyone? Don't be shy. That he was assassinated. Yes, great. Yes. That's, uh, he was assassinated in 1983. Marcos was his main rival and had him gunned down. We do not know about that, though. Um, it's still a mystery who was the mastermind, though. Yes, an airport was named after him. Yeah, that's that's also correct. Um, because that airport was named after him because he was he was shot there basically. Okay, uh, I think that those are the things that uh, had come up. You know? so thank you, Paul Anthony Valdez, Vicente Eason, uh, and Drake, for your answers. Um, I guess we should uh, begin with the basics. Okay, so I'm, I'm now going to share my screen. Yeah. There we go, liwanag sa dilim. Uh, ang laban ni Noy Aquino sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to contextualize yung kanyang life in the context of uh, Philippine history. So I'm not just going to talk about his life, I would, I'm going to talk about, uh, well, of course, the main reason why he, Ninoy Aquino is important is because uh, uh, of martial law. Okay? If martial law did not, ha ha did not happen, Ninoy would not, have been an, uh, would not have been the hero that he became. So, well, of course, there are some people who said that he, he was not a hero. He founded the Communist Party of the Philippines. There are these allegations like that. Uh, let's look at these uh, things. All right, so if you have questions, please subscribe in my YouTube channel and TikTok. Uh, uh, I hope you can help me garner more followers. Uh, follow me in Facebook in my, and other social media accounts and on TikTok and websites, shaochua.net and bangkanishao.wordpress.com. All right, so I have to confess that... Uh, Ninoy Aquino was actually, is actually very, uh, shall we say, uh, since I was a kid, I was already a, interested in the life of Senator Aquino because I came from his home province, Tarlac. Okay, so since I was a kid, and here you see this, I, I, I have read about him and uh, talked about him from my, my school in Tarlac uh, City. Tarlac First Baptist Church School was uh, in front of the library, the public library. And from there, I was able to read books about Ninoy. Um, and so, yeah, for, so if you're going to look at it, I was near the place where he worked. He was governor of Tarlac, uh, Tarlac Province. He was the youngest governor of Tarlac. And this is his statue. And that's me as a kid. And this is a picture of Senator, a, a, a painting of Senator Aquino in the provincial capital. Eventually, in 1997, I I was in first year high school when uh, I watched the documentary Batas Militar, and uh, that is when I was <coughs> I, <coughs> I further became interested on uh, Senator Aquino and the and martial law. The Marcos regime that eventually I became, shall we say, my, my expertise in history became the martial law regime and people power. So I interviewed uh, Mrs. Imelda Romualdez Marcos when I was in college for my thesis and eventually for my master's as well. And uh, I also interviewed uh, President Corazon Aquino when I was young. Uh, Corazon Aquino, of course, is the, has, uh, the wife of Senator Nino Aquino. And I was able to also interview the son 
of Senator Nino Aquino uh, uh, at that time congressman uh, uh, Noy Noy Aquino who would eventually become president of the Republic of the Philippines. So there we go. So this is Senator Nino Aquino. For many people, uh, he was he, his claim to fame is that he was the father of uh, Chris Aquino. So Chris Aquino is a famous actress in the Philippines, and this is Nino Aquino with uh, Chris Aquino just before he was arrested during martial law. Okay, so let's uh, talk about Senator Nino Aquino. Senator Nino Aquino was, uh, and I have to check this because I, I don't want to be wrong. Senator Nino Aquino was uh, born in uh, Concepcion uh, Tarlac on November 27, 1932. Okay. Uh, so this is baby Ninoy. His father was the one of the uh, officials of the Philippines during the Japanese period, Benigno Aquino Sr. Okay. And Benigno Aquino Sr. Uh, eventually was, while, while Ninoy was growing up uh, and the war ended, Benigno Aquino Sr. was uh, touted as a collaborator for the Japanese. So this is when uh, Ninoy Aquino actually suffered uh, discrimination because he was a son of um, of a perceived traitor. No? So, and uh, he actually, as a young boy, so his father died. I think he died in the arms of Ninoy, if I'm not mistaken with the stories that I remember told to me by the, uh, by some people that he actually saw how his father died. Uh, and uh, he basically vowed that he's going to, shall we say, do something to make up and uh, bring back the reputation of the Aquino name because he loved his father so much and basically did not like what happened uh, with his father i mean remember that uh with laurel and with the uh with who is this guy with with laurel and jorge vargas benigno aquino was just uh, left by Quezon to talk to the Japanese. But uh, I think he, Aquino Sr. was more, more vocal in his support of the Japanese, all-out support of the Japanese than perhaps Laurel or even Vargas. So that is why he was really the target of discrimination. Now, I'm discussing this because this became a big motivation on why Ninoy, even as a young boy, was so driven Sobrang driven ni Nino Aquino that uh, when he was still uh, uh, studying law in uh, UP at 17 years old. Well, remember, he was 17 years old. Um, hey, wait a minute. Okay, so he was in... Uh, he was he, he studied in uh, yeah. He studied in uh, Saint Joseph's College of Quezon City. So that's where he got his uh, elementary education. He went to high school in San Beda College, and he took tertiary uh, education at Ateneo de Manila to ob obtain a Bachelor of Arts degree. But he interrupted his studies, so he did not finish. So that is when, or oh, he's not yet in UP, at the age of uh, 17, he applied to become uh, a correspondent to the war in Korea. So I would like to, to uh, tell you uh, first about this, that Ninoy Aquino went to, um, who, who is the traitor, the, the, the father? Oh yeah, some people said he was, but uh, of course they were not tried because they were um, 
some some were acting on the interest of uh, the Filipinos, even if they worked uh, under the Japanese, because these people um, basically, uh, anong tawag dito, saved a lot of Filipino lives. But I I, I guess, but I but I guess the the dad was, I think, quite supportive with the Japanese. So. In many ways, he was a collaborator. That's what, what I mean. Let's be objective about it. Uh, just let, let's just call him a collaborator. Uh, whether he's a traitor or not is actually um, something that is, uh, shall we say, controversial, to say the least. Okay, so I, uh, I, I got interrupted. Okay, um, so there he went to the Manila Times. Si Chino Roses yung publisher niyan. Chino Roses of the Manila Times. And he became like a copy boy. A copy boy. He was, uh, he will uh, type stories that came from other reporters and pass them. And some even said that he became a, he, 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 he was tagatimpla ng kape, shall we say. So he was a lowly assistant in the Manila Times when he was 17 years old when the Manila Times publisher asked who wants to go to Korea to cover the war, he raised his hand. And he said, I'm going to cover the war. He is 17 years old. But what happened was he was able to get the job because the, the people at the times, they have family, families, and they do not want to go to war because that will, you know, basically endanger their lives. So it was Ninoy Aquino who was sent to Korea. He became the war correspondent at the age of 70 now. Of course, as a young boy, hindi pa siya marunong gumawa ng mga magagaling na sentences. So one American lady, uh, uh, an American uh, journalist actually helped him write his stories. Oh, but yes, he became a correspondent in the Korean War, shall we say. So he went back uh, to the Philippines. And uh, so this is, this is uh, uh, where is Nino Yakino here? Actually, he, he created the film about his uh, uh, experiences in Korea. He was the writer of that uh, film. And this is actually Senator Aquino. So very young and very handsome. Very cutesy, very demure, very mindful. So what did they do? So Senator Aquino, he received the Legion of Honor from President Quirino at age 18 because of what he did in Korea. And at 21, he became a close advisor to the Defense Secretary Ramon Magsaysay. At 21, a close advisor to Defense Secretary Ramon Magsaysay, while he was taking up law at the University of the Philippines, he became a part member of the Upsilon Sigma Phi, where Ferdinand Marcos was also a member. So, naging brad niya si Marcos. No? And uh, he interrupted his career again in law. He did not finish law, but according to some of his classmates, he, he, did, he doesn't go to class, but he comes to class every exam. And uh, when the exam comes, he will just borrow the notebook of, of uh, his classmate. And after he read, reads it, he would ace the exam. He would ace the exam even if he was not going to class. Okay? So that's how intelligent Ninoy was. He had the photographic memory for facts and for... Um, for, for such things. Now, um, he did not continue his uh, law studies. What he did is at the age of uh, 21, he went to the mountains to broker the surrender of Luis Taruk. And who was Luis Taruk? Luis Taruk was the number one rebel during the time of Magsaysay. Huh? So, that is where Ninoy, at the age of 21, was able to um, make Tarok go down the mountains. Uh, 
I'll, 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 I'll also relate to you the story that, of course, Luis Tabuk was a communist. He was a member of the Hook or leader of, founder of the Hook, who once fought the Japanese. And what is important here to remember is that Ninoy Aquino, while listening to Tarok, actually actually learned from Tarok. Because Tarok was teaching Ninoy about, you know, um, the rich and the poor, the plight between the rich and the poor, uh, and all of that, you know, that he should, he should, he should be so poor. And so that's where Nino Aquino got his ideas. Uh, he became so poor in many ways, okay, because of Luis Tarouk. Okay, so Luis Tarouk went down to the mountains, and eventually, after uh, Luis Tarouk uh, was surrendered, after a year, he married Corazon Cojuanco. Now, Ninoy Aquino is a, is a political family also from Tarlac, but uh, he married uh, a Colegiala, Cori, who came from two big political families, the Cojuancos of Tarlac who eventually will own, eventually will buy Hacienda Luisita. And uh, the, who is this person? Ah, the Sumulongs of Rizal. Sumulong of Rizal. Rizal province. So, two, so this is a marriage of uh, political families in many ways, but they did love each other. And uh, Ninoy eventually went to public service. What happened was, uh, Ninoy became mayor of Concepcion at the age of 23 years old. Just imagine, huh? So he was given, uh, for Tabuk's uh, surrender, he was given another Legion of Honor by Magsaysay. He became mayor of Concepcion in 1955. Huh? And... Uh, after five years, he was elected the youngest uh, vice governor uh, of, uh, of Tarlac. No? And, and the youngest vice governor at 27 in Tarlac. Okay? Because Bongbong Marcos became the youngest governor at 22 in 1980. Okay? The, per the president now. Now, two years later, the governor of Tarlac was appointed... Uh, to cabinet post, and so in 1961, sorry, sorry, uh, two years later, what's two years later? Two years later, in 1955, 57, oh, sorry, sorry, 1955, and then seven years later. Oh, there we go, 1955, and then seven years later. Yeah, around this time as well. Uh, 1961, he became governor of Tarlac. Okay? So, young youngest governor. Uh, uh, at that time. Now, uh, so as governor, he was an action man. But basically, what I'm going to tell you is that he was also, shall we say, he, or oh, this is this is like the complication of the story. He was a traditional politician. He was young. He was brilliant. He was talented. But he was a traditional politician. So he had. Uh, Ano tawag dito? He, he had guns. He had guns. He had gold. Huh? So, but this is the context of that time. This is the time of warlordism. So the stronger the warlord you are, you are able to hold control and you are able to keep the peace. Ninoy Aquino was also, be, also became the administrator of the Hacienda Luisita. In which, when he was administrator of the Hacienda Luisita, he gave free education, free hospitalization, free housing uh, to the to the tenants of the Hacienda, which is basically he made it a mini welfare state, and this is what he got from Tabuk. Okay, so 
that was his achievements. But this is what I'm tell you, telling you. He was a he was a trapo. He was a traditional politician. Okay? So eventually what happened was he, became, he was elected to become the youngest senator of the Philippines and he was able to do that even if he was unknown because he used the chopper of Cory of the Kuwanko family, the chopper of the Kuwanko family to go around the country and make grand entrances, so to, so to speak. He used the Beatles because that was in 1960s uh, in 1960, I think 1967, is that right? Yeah. Uh, he used the slogan, yeah, youth experience hope. So like the Beatles said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Ninoy Aquino for Senator, um, he was charismatic, shall, uh, uh, as uh, shall we say. Uh, and uh, he won, he became the youngest Senator of the Republic at the age of uh, 35, if I'm not mistaken. So, there was even an issue that when he was elected, he was 34. But he, when, when, when his term began, he was 35. And there was a disqualification case against him, which he won. Now it's clear in the rules, in the law, that you should be 35 upon election, not upon assumption of duties. So that is that. Okay. One issue that happened when Ninoy was senator was the Jabi the Massacre. Now, the Jabi the Massacre is a is an unfortunate incident where Pausug uh, young uh, warriors were being trained to infiltrate Saba so that we can get Saba back again from the Malaysia. And uh, they were killed in the camp in uh, Corregidor. Okay? And when uh, one of the survivors actually um, survived that massacre of, uh, or mutiny, shall we say, mutiny, because the Taosug uh, warriors rebelled against their commanders and they were killed by the, um, by the military. One of the survivors reported to Senator Aquino. So he, he was, he, it was Senator Aquino and this Senator Aquino with Jibin Arula and they exposed the Jabi the massacre, the plan to, and the, and, and the plan to infiltrate Malaysia. Okay, so he had all these uh, exposés. He was a uh, uh, he exposed. Uh, he was he criticized, for example, Imelda Marcos for spending money to create the cultural center of the Philippines, and uh, he, he he compared Imelda Marcos to Argentina's first lady Evita Peron or Eva Peron. And this really made Imelda very, very angry because there was once in their lives that they dated. Okay? They dated before because by marriage, their families were actually relatives. Okay? So when they were younger, they were dating. They, they did not become it, but uh, they, were, they were going out. Okay? Um, so Ninoy Aquino became like a, a larger-than-life figure in a way criticizing Marcos for uh, many, many things. Uh, uh, so they were not, shall we say, they were not, you know, even if they're brads, uh, they're, uh, they're really nemesis to each other. You know, Aquino actually um, legislated, where's this? Yeah, you know, Aquino legislated a law that uh, mandates that you can study now and you can pay later. So it's like a scholarship fund. And this was, of course, one of his uh, innovations as a senator of the Republic. Okay. So, Marcos and Imelda, let's look at the context of uh, that time. It was the time when people were asking for change around the world. And the students got wind of that, and some of them become radical activists. Some of them became moderate activists. And the moderate activists, of course, were social democrats and the radicals were, of course, they were, some of them were um, advocating for a violent overthrow of the um, government, 
shall so to speak because of the many many uh, uh, corruption and issues already against the government and so when marcos uh won his second term in 1970 and uh, addressed the congress for his state of the nation address uh, there were 25,000 people who massed around the congress but eventually that protest uh, became violent and they threw rocks on the president and eventually that uh, that uh, began a violent dispersal of students uh, which was repeated again after four days in the siege of Malacanang where uh, students violently stormed the, pal the palace gates and the presidential guard battalion retaliated by shooting um, the protesters and four students died because of this violent clash. This was in 1970 and uh, eventually all of these student protests, including the Diliman Commune of 1971 and the Plaza Miranda bombing where the party of Ninoy, the Liberal Party, Liberal Party, um, what they call this rally, was bombed. The party of Ninoy. Ninoy haven't uh, arrived on the stage, but if he did, he would have uh, experienced the blast which uh, basically um, um, killed around nine people, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, wounded about a hundred uh, people. So at that time, the issue was Marcos was having dictatorial tendencies during the uh, Plaza Miranda bombing or after the Plaza Miranda bombing, he suspended the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. So meaning you can uh, you can be arrested without warrant of arrest and without being charged in court. So the student slogan were, was Marcos Hitler, Dictador Tuta. Which is ironic because you call Marcos a Hitler and a dictator, but you also call him a lapdog, lapdog of the Americans. Now, uh, the Communist Party of the Philippines became in a way strong but not as strong as the government wants to believe uh, and the new people's army its armed wing uh, was able to amass a few followers but not as big as the government wants us to perceive yet there was this massive shipment of arms from china which was eventually intercepted by the government this is the incident called mv uh, incident on of the mv karagatan and this incident where they confiscated so many guns was eventually used as, a, uh, as a, a, an excuse to declare martial law. Okay? So according to Ambassador Manuelian, it, it wasn't needed. They did not need to have that... Uh, um, they did not need to have that... Uh, ano ito? Um... They did not need to declare martial law because the powers of the government, the powers of the military, the power of the president can already quell that rebellion. But what could have been the reason? Some of them said, or some people speculated that Marcos wanted to declare martial law so that he can stay after 1973 because that is where his term will end, 1973. And so... Uh, I, 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 I would like to believe that Manuel Yan was correct when he said that we did not need martial law at that time. There are only about 2,000 cadres of the New People's Army. 2,000 cadres. How can they um, take over the government, so to speak? But pero nangyari na nga dyan, on September 22, 1972, there was this ambush against Juan Ponce Enrile. Supposedly, his car was uh, shot, but he, he uh, changed to another car. That's why he got saved. Uh, but apparently, that is actually a stage and a fake ambush. When uh, Enrile was ambushed, the military uh, um, now began to arrest many of the opposition leaders, senators, 
newspaper men. So these are the first few uh, people that were arrested uh, in the Camp Krame. So you see number one, Senator Aquino, Senator Ramon Mitra, Senator Diocno, Maximo Soliven is a newspaper man, uh, Vicente Rafael, uh, Soc Rodrigo, uh, Senator Soc Rodrigo, Volter Garcia, who was a student activist, Teodoro Loxin, a junior son of a, of a journalist, uh, Joaquin Roses, Chino Roses, Naprama, all of these people were eventually arrested. So the first ones were Nino Yaquino and Jose W. Diocno. Okay. So they closed down all the newspaper, media, television, radio, everything. And so by the 23rd, uh, only the Wacky Races was watched. It was a cartoons. And it, it now means that we are now under the control of our daddy and mommy, uh, daddy Andy and mommy Meldy. And by around 7 o'clock in the evening, Marcos appears on television to say, uh, my uh, countrymen, as of the... 21st of uh, this month. I signed proclamation number 1081, placing the entire Philippines under martial law. This uh, proclamation was to be implemented upon my clearance, and clearance was granted at uh, 9 o'clock in the evening of the 22nd, last night. I have uh, proclaimed martial law in accordance with the powers vested in the president by the Constitution of the Philippines. So, sabi ni Marcos, if you were a civilian, if you were a civilian, uh, ano nga ba yun yung, uh, now, the limit has been reached for we are against the world. We must now defend the Republic of the Philippines with this stronger power vested upon me by the Constitution. To those guilty of treason, insurrection, rebellion, it may pose a great danger. But to the ordinary citizenry, almost all of you, whose primary concern is merely to be left alone, to ensure your lawful activities, this is the guarantee of that freedom that you seek. All that I do and we in government must do is for the Republic and for you. Yan, yeah, yung sinabi ni Marcos. I actually have here on my wall huh, an actual copy of the newspaper that came out the next day, September 24. FM declares martial law the most famous headline in Philippine history. FM declares martial law to save the republic and form a new society. So there we go. Yeah. All right. Yes, the very first cartoons that was uh, aired when martial law was declared was Dick Dastardly, uh, as Wacky Races, Dick Dastardly, Penelope Pitts, stop having a race, you see? Yeah, and Matley, the dog. <laughs> so you now say, you know, behave kids, this cartoon's time, behave. You're now children of the dictator, yeah, stuff like that. Okay, so there we go. Now, let's uh, move on. You know, on the first day of martial law, they started to cut the hair of people. It's bad for men to have long hair. So even the police, they became barbers. I don't know what the haircut looked after. You see, what was uh, quite an achievement of martial law, even if I'm a critic of it, was that martial law was able to take away from private armies thousands of guns 
that would have been used uh, by the by these private armies. Okay? So, according to Marcos, two years before this, he said, uh, if we do not prepare measures of counteraction, they will not only succeed in assassinating me, but in taking over the government. So we must perfect our emergency plan. I have several options. One of them is to abort the subversive plan now by the sudden arrest of the plotters, but this would not be accepted by the people. So this was during the time when there was a riot in Congress, before the riot in Malacanang. So this is what he was saying. He wanted to declare martial law, the emergency plan, but that would not be accepted by the people at that time. So he said, we could allow the situation to develop naturally. Then after massive terrorism, wanton killings and an attempt at my assassination and a coup d'etat, then declare martial law or suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus and arrest all, including the legal cadres. Right now, I'm inclined towards the latter. So what did, why did he want to just allow the situation to develop instead of nipping it in the bud? Simply, if I want to be perpetuated in power, this is the easier way to it. So there you go. He wanted to perpetuate himself to power, and after two years, that is what he did. He declared martial law. Now, of course, some of the uh, fans of the dictator wants to say that he did a lot of infrastructure projects for the people, the electrification of the whole country, uh, trains and expressways and you know, dams, and Imelda Marcos also as governor of Metro Manila and minister of human settlements actually did a lot of good projects for, uh, for the people, for the government, like, you know, Metro Aid who sweeps the, the streets, you have the home, home for the aged, home for the orphan men, uh, girls and boys, you have the Metro Aid and the River Aid cleaning the, the streets and the rivers, you have Love Bus, the first air-conditioned bus in the Philippines. Uh, and there was the, there was the Kadiwa, which of course is now being revived by the present Marcos administration. The Kadiwa stores with um, cheap, uh, cheap uh, basic services. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, Bo. There was housing project. There was housing projects, and there was the Nayong Filipino and the rehabilitation of Intramuros, and you have the cultural center complex buildings that are still in use today, like the Philippine International Convention Center, the the, the Philippine International Convention Center, the Folk Arts Theater, the cultural center, the. Film Center, the, the Art Center, Lung Center, Kidney Center, you have the National Arts Center, you have Nutrition Center, Population Center, Bagong Lipunan Health Centers, all of these things. While also, so Marcos was good on infrastructure, for example, for all of these centers that we still use today, and for uh, also giving incentives to the arts. There were so many projects on culture and the arts during the time of my mother, Imelda Momoades Marcos. But yeah, uh, uh, what happened was uh, as, uh, that was the facade to a dark reality, which was the suppression of unionism, the suppression of dissent, uh, militarization of the country, and of course, illegal detention and torture of thousands of Filipinos in the military camps in Metro Manila and also in the provinces. There were people, politicians, who were not really physically tortured, but they were given psychological torture. This was Senate of Diokno looking at the victim of physical torture and rape. Some of them you can read their their, their their life stories. They were documented by Amnesty International, by their 
uh, task force detainees of the Philippines. And uh, you can read their stories here. I'm not going to detail this too much, but basically, uh, for those who do not want to, or for those who are criticizing the government at that time, there is a big danger that you get arrested and they are going to elect either electrocute you or, or uh, electrocute you. Uh, well, this is trigger warning, of course. Electrocute you from your uh, uh, penis, for example. The, you, you will be given the San Juanico Bridge treatment. Uh, you will be given a tooth serum so you can be talkative. There's Russian roulette. There's beating. Uh, there's a pistol whipping. And there's, of course, the water cure, which is terrible. Okay? So when, you, when, you're, when your stomach is already filled with the water that they made you drink, they're going to beat you until you bleed. And you, 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 you take out the water from your stomach. That's how it was. There was strangulation and also animal treatment, burning, pepper torture. Animal treatment is when they, 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 they almost feed you to the dogs, so to speak, as a naked person. No? And then, of course, one of the worst is the sexual abuse of women. So, despite the fact that these were really scary things, some of the people actually helped the victim scope, including a detainee herself, Sister Mariani, who created the task force detainees of the Philippines. She helped the um, activists in the jail scope. Uh, and uh, what happened? Okay, let's, there was also this, the, what's this, the uh, wet submarine torture. Um, and this, uh, so these are the things that were happening. The human rights grows, human rights violations that were recorded during the Marcos regime. Uh, and also, of course, extrajudicial killings, like the killing of the journalist Primitivo Mijares who was once one of the BFF of Marcos, but he eventually turned against him to write the conjugal dictatorship of Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos I. He was never found again. His son, Boyet, who was 16 at the time, was eventually found dead. He was thrown out from a helicopter. His corpse was thrown out from a helicopter, and he, it was found he was tortured brutally. 33 ice pick wounds around the body. And, uh, you know, I learned these stories from Batas Militar documentary, which, by the way, your mom, Ampi, helped to create in 1997. And that is the documentary that changed my life. And Ampi, your teacher, mom, Ampi, created, was one of the creators of that. Okay? He was uh, one of the uh, uh, ones who helped them make the film. So Boyet was thrown from the helicopter. You have people like Bonnie Ilagan, whom you can watch their stories in YouTube. Ala Ala, Martial Law Special. And uh, yeah, you have people being killed like Risalina. Risalina Ilagan was never found. You have Billy, Billy Begg who was killed. He was a young guy who lo loved his country. Edgar Hobson. Lorena Barros, Emanuel Lacaba, these are young people who would have had, who would have had uh, became leaders of our country for their love of country. They laid their lives for the country, but such a waste because of these human rights violations. And even doctors from the barrios, Bobby De La Paz and, um, and Makling Dulag and uh, Johnny Escandor and all the other massacres that happened during the Marcos era, including the massacre at uh, where? Palimbang. For some children. Can, can you hear it? Did, did you hear a sound? A, a bit, yes, yes. Uh, let's try, because I have a speaker anyway, so let's try to watch that. Are you still uh, okay?
For some children, the brutality of the military is not a fairy tale. Marela, who is only eight years old, tells what happened when the soldiers came to her village. This boy watched from the safety of a coconut tree soldiers questioning his father. Chatu, pag siya rin nga hinto, hinto ni tatay, pag pagkawang bintiw ni Rami, ngan gapuso ni Yaliwap, din ni, ngan timulag, gin, kuwana, gin gapuso at andin ni, ngan katinan andin ni, ngan katinan andin ni, ngan katinan andin ni, ngan ipalingi, ngan tagnus ni Rami, ngan kuwana niya, gutbuton andin ni, timulag to, Ira pag inuyagan ng ulo, magkwarang kahoy ngan. Ira sipaon na itong punong lubi. Pag-abot nga ito, tahu ba nira han daw ng lubi para diri kilalon. Ano naman yung magkukuha doon sa sinya na kukuha sa nyo yung plano na nyo yung bukan ng tatay? Kay pag makabulos, manalimbasyo kay bisan pa man nga ni Chiu nga puti pa nga ni, turo siya kung dako na nga ni na ato na tungod yung limpipi na ato. Oh, there we go. So that was the situation. If this that was Las Navas massacre in Samang. Now Las Navas massacre was linked to a lagging operation of uh, someone who is immortal. I'm not going to mention his name, but he is immortal. Okay? So the area of Las Navas Samang was where his lagging activities were. Then you have a Palimbang Massacre in Mindanao where about 1,000 people were killed in a mosque. Huh? Um, yeah, this was really a terrible, and this is actually true. This is true, okay? There are people who spoke about it. So these were the 11,100 victims of human rights violations under martial law, only those that were verified verified but uh, there were 70,000 claims and all of them are actually um we do not know but uh, these are really you know it's very hard to substantiate it but you cannot cancel other people whose experiences are were not documented but really happened so they were able to come forward but um it has to be that there was a a, a confirmation in a way so some of the claimants for the compensation of human rights violations um they were crying when they received their money see um marcos was uh the the, the money came from the marcos loot that uh, he was able to stash away and uh, deposit in the swiss banks there we go. They were buying for one day uh, worth of jewelry, $1.4 million, while the economy suffered. So at first, during martial law time, the economy was good, but eventually, his dictatorial uh, powers was not able to solve the country's problems, which eventually went to the 
crash of 1983, <coughs> which was our lowest point after World War II and before COVID-19. This was our lowest point. Some people said Corey did not uh, lift the economy, but actually she did, except that there were also many problems like power, uh, she did, they here, 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 Cory Aquino, she did. But there were also a lot of problems like coup d'etat, Mount Pinatubo eruption, the earthquake, and the power crisis. Uh, that's why it, 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 uh, it, uh, it got uh, a, a little bad, but Ramos was able to lift it up again. Gloria was able to put the, in, uh, the, fundamentals, economic fundamentals, which uh, Noy Noy Aquino, the greatest, the, the longest sustained growth of the economy during his time, and Duterte before COVID-19. So that is that. So they had so much loot accounting to about $10 billion according to the Philippine government, while Imelda admits that she actually have 0.8 billion dollars in secret accounts um even if they did not actually have a lot of money that they declared in their tax uh, uh, income tax returns so they only had what some um, 76000 pesos uh before he became president and here you have 189000 pesos before he became president, not millions of dollars or billions of dollars, but they were able to. They're now uh, the 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 mother was saying that they did have those money, and they were buying a lot of jewelry and paintings, Michelangelo paintings. So this is one is for the uh, where's that Michelangelo painting? Yeah, the Michelangelo paintings there. While the country suffered immense poverty. Okay. Ninoy Aquino, who was in prison at that time, 1972 to 1980, he smuggled some articles to the Bangkok Post, which made Marcos very angry. That's why. Um, one one night they returned the things of Ninoy to his family and then the family asked what is this where are you go what are you going to do with uh where, where did you take him and then uh, uh why did you bring uh, back his uh, things ang sabi ng mga sundalo hindi na po niya kailangan yan my God, hindi na po niya kailangan yan. That really made them nervous that maybe Ninoy was dead. But Ninoy was uh, imprisoned in uh, La Ur Nueva Ecija. Nobody, nobody was allowed to talk to him and Senator Diokno. They were not allowed to talk to each other. But it was prohibited. They took away his belt, his... Uh, uh, his watches, his eyeglasses, so he suffered suffered terrible headaches. And then uh, he described this ordeal. He said, they brought me to a mountain hideout in a Sierra Madre and placed me in a box. I have only my brief and my t-shirt. I refused to eat because I thought they were poisoning me. There was nothing in the room, barely nothing. They have nothing to do but twiddle my thumb. And for the first time of, in my life, I heard that ticking every second and I was counting every second into minutes. And as the minutes marched into hours and the hours into days and days into weeks, I knew what loneliness meant. So that is what he experienced. He disowned God. He said, God doesn't exist because why are these bad people uh, reigning the world? And so... Marcos eventually, Ninoy, I mean, eventually prayed the rosary and reflected on the life of Christ. And eventually he realized that uh, his sufferings were little 
to what Jesus Christ actually uh, what Jesus Christ actually suffered and he, he 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 it is as if he heard God say why are you crying I gave you a political career I gave you a loving family I gave you all the blessings in the world and you are now crying and whimpering like a spoiled brat so that is when Ninoy realized that um, God has been so good to him. And according to Ninoy, this is where he found God and he realized that <coughs> he should change. And so from being a traditional politician, he became a Christian. He was transformed by the power of the life of Christ and uh, he, he continued to appeal his case to the Supreme Court because he said why is a military court oh you have to you have to know this story this is a before I, I go there Nino, Ninoy's family and Yokno's family still don't know where they were and Ninoy Aquino when he prayed to God he said Lord, <coughs> just give me 30 minutes. After that, I can die. And he prayed for nine days. And on the ninth day, Cory Aquino came and his children came to visit him. And they were, and, and the guard said, Sir, you have 30 minutes. But the only problem was there was a chicken wire in between them. And that was the very first time they saw Ninoy cry. So they cannot touch each other. There was a chicken wire between them. and uh, But they were able to see each other and uh, that was that. Now, Ninoy was brought back to Manila from La Ur Nueva Ecija after his ordeal. And the uh, trial began. He did not want to participate in it because it was <coughs> a military court. Oh. But uh, he also went on hunger strike. Like the hunger strike, he, he joined the hunger strikers of Bikutan. These are the political detainees of Bikutan. Uh, the, he, he staged a hunger strike and his hunger strike lasted for 40 days. He became so thin. Remember, Ninoy Aquino was big, but he became so thin. See? On the 40th day, he, he was convinced by his friend, the historian, Horacio de la Costa to stop the fasting, to stop the, the fasting on the 40th day, which is the day that the Lord, the, the days that the Lord fast, fasted. <coughs> so there we go. He, that is where I think that was his greatest moment. When there was the 40 day hunger strike, that is when he showed his sincerity to fight with the people. Because 40-day hunger strike is no joke. Okay? It's, it was no joke. Eventually, he was sentenced to death by firing squad. But he was able to run from prison to become assemblyman of Manila in the 1978. Lakas ng... Uh, 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 how was that? The... Uh, interim batasang pambansa elections. So he ran under the uh, party lakas ng bayan or laban. That is the meaning of the L sign. So if you see the if you see uh, 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 people doing the L sign, that means laban. All right. So let's continue our story. So. Even if he campaigned from prison through his children, even if he was so famous, he lost from basically unknown candidates. Basically unknown candidates. What's that Pokemon? Oh, no, no video. Okay. 
So, eventually, what happened was, Ninoy suffered a heart attack. He was brought to the heart center, and he said, why are you bringing me to the heart center? That's the heart center of Imelda Marcos. But uh, eventually, he asked permission to the Marcoses to allow him to have a medical treatment in the United States. He said he promised that he's going to bring only two of his children. And uh, he said he will not speak against Marcos in America. Okay. And so what happened? One day, May 8th, Ninoy recounted, my wife visited me early in the morning. This was in the heart center. And she told me, the hospital was crawling with Metrocom cars, guards all over the place. Pakai ka may magbibisita sa'yo. Then all of a sudden, my, sudden my guards started jumping, putting them barang Tagalog, hiding all of their guns. I said, tama, may darating na VIP. And then lo and behold, the beautiful one ascended into my suite. That was Imelda. Imelda Marcos. She came and she was really beautiful. She has not aged. And she sat down and said, Naku Ninoy, sabi niya, I'm sorry to see you like that. Hindi ko lang nasabi sa kanya, eh, kayo may kagagawa nito eh. Sabi niya. And then after a few minutes, Imelda Marcos said, Would you like to go to America? And Ninoy said, Abay kako, sure, sure, oh. E sa tuwa ko, tinanggal ko yung aking kwintas, kako ang tinganting ko to, iwanan ko na kako kay Per dito. Palayasin niyo ako, papuntayin niyo ako sa Amerika. Sabi niya, there's a plane leaving at 6 o'clock. You can be in that plane. Abay kako, thank you. So on that day, Ninoy Aquino left the Philippines for the United States. For about three years, uh, for law in the United States to treat his heart condition. So he had a triple bypass. So what does it mean? He had a heart attack. His heart uh, was operated on, but his heart was running on batteries. So there are times when the, those batteries will run off, you will feel weakness. You cannot try it. Uh, so that was his condition. But in uh, in in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Marcos was supposed to he was supposed to go back after treatment and go back to jail. But Marcos suspended the uh, uh, but, but Marcos uh, allowed him indefinite stay in the United States. Uh, and so he went to uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and uh, he also became a fellow at Harvard. Huh? Um, he also spent the best time of his life with his family. In Boston, when he was far from politics, he was able to play with his young daughter, Chris Aquino. Diba? Uh, he saw Bolsi's uh, graduation uh, in the United States. Is that Bolsi or? Yeah, yeah, I think it's Bolsi. Bolsi, no? Bolsi is. Is that right? Oh, that's Viel. I think that's Viel. Yeah, I think it's Viel. So, yeah, si Viel nga, si Viel nga yung nag-graduate. Si Bolsi, Bolsi Pinky Viel. Okay, si Viel nga yung nag-graduate. And, uh, yeah, so they had a the happy happy time there. But there's something that Ninoy felt he should do in the Philippines. Marcos was already sick with uh, a certain condition. Uh, ano ba yung sickness ni Marcos? I'm going to tell you now the sickness of Marcos. This is according to uh, one pods and really uh eto and really and really oh, i don't have it here no sa so, merong ano organ failure basically it's it's uh <coughs> it's like a complication of lupus erythematosus so kabaka nandito I, 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 I should i should know that eh.
Wait lang ah. I don't have it. Anyway, whatever it is, no? Marcos was sick and uh, Ninoy was worried that if Marcos will not um, step down, the communists will win in the Philippines. So, contrary to popular belief, yes, he when he was still a, a governor of Tavlak and he was a senator, he played the, he played along with the communists and the new people's army so that he will not be hassled. And it was like a, ta a tactical alliance, shall we say. But he did not want them to win. So Marcos, uh, Ninoy wanted to talk to Marcos to help him to help him have clean elections and have a credible government that would deter any attack from the communists. So he wanted to talk to Marcos and he believed that Jesus Christ is still in the heart of Marcos. That he can talk to the Jesus Christ in the heart of Marcos. That is what he thought. He knows that he's going to be imprisoned back again or even killed. That was the, that was the gamble that he was willing to take. And so he called this cousin, Senator Eva Estrada Calau. He said, uh, Parang Mel and Doc, I need your maximum support in this Pakulo because it may be the last time for a long time. I'm preparing for the worst and we won't get another chance like this for a long time. However, if we can really gather a crowd, this could be a repeat of Laban's Noise Rally five years ago. You only have five weeks to prepare. You see? So he wanted people to come when he will be coming. Okay. So he will he he, he was uh he was uh, coming on August 21. This was his letter to Senator M, Senator Emma Estrada Calau. And uh, the crowd gathered. No? One one uh one uh, scenario was that he is going to be brought uh to the camp through a stairs uh, near the airport or near the plane i mean so to the tarmac and then to be brought back to fort bonifacio to be imprisoned again so he wanted the crowd to be there that was like a security blanket he also brought media men there huh? and uh, that was the uh he also chose the date of his return that was the anniversary of the Plaza Miranda bombing, August 21, 1971. Okay. So, Ninoy, so now the crowd was ready. They, they, they had yellow ribbons. And this is based on the song Taya Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree by Tony Orlando and the Don. I say it's been three long years. Diba? Parang Taya Yellow Ribbon. Round the old oak tree. It's been three long years. Do you still want me? If I don't see a ribbon round the old oak tree, I'll stay on the bus. Forget about us. Put the blame on me. If I don't see a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. So it's basically a prisoner who comes home hoping that there'll be yellow ribbons to say that he's still welcome. Because it's been three long years and Ninoy was actually already forgotten. Seven years in prison and three years in exile in the United States. Not so many people can actually even remember him. Oh, but uh, he was the the uh, the opposition was able to gather a crowd. And Ninoy had that trip from America, I think from Los uh, from Massachusetts to Los Angeles. He went down uh, I think Singapore. And from Singapore, he went to Malaysia, and eventually he went to Taipei. And from Taipei, this is like the hotel in Taipei where he, be he, 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 he became ready. This is where he gave his famous interview where he said, you have to be very ready with your hand cameras because this action can become very fast, you know. In a matter of three, four minutes, he could be all over, you know. And <laughs> I may not be able to talk to you again after this. This is the danger, the big danger. So that was the interview that he gave. And he went to the plane. 
uh, it's a China Airlines flight going to Manila, August 21, 1983. To add protection so that it could save his life, he wore a bulletproof vest. Before landing, he wore a bulletproof vest at the lavatory. And uh, this was the one of his last photographs that were taken, one of the most iconic ones by Asia Week photographer. Before he left uh, Taiwan, he was able to give letters to his children and to Corey before he boarded the plane. And I would like to read to you what he gave to Corey. My dearest Corey, in a few hours, I shall be embarking on an uncertain fate which may well be the end of a long struggle. I slept well last night for the first time since I left Boston. Maybe because I'm just plain tired or I'm really at peace with myself. I want to tell you many things, but time is running out and I do not have any machine. This is for his heart, you know. After a few more paragraphs, my penmanship will be illegible. All the things I want to tell you may be capsulized in one line. I love you. You've stood by me in my most trying moments and there were times I was very hard on you. But if anyone will ever understand me, it is you. And I know you will always find it in your heart to forgive. And unfair and ironic as it is, it is because of this thought and belief that I often took you for granted. Early on, I knew I was not meant to make money, so I won't be able to leave anything to the children. I did what I thought I could do best, which is public service, and I hope our people in time will appreciate my sacrifices. This would be my legacy to the children. I may not bequeath them material wealth, but I leave them a tradition which can be priceless. I realize I've been stingy with my praise and appreciation of all your efforts. But no one said, you know that as far as I'm concerned, you are the best. And that's why we've lasted this long. There will only be one thing in the world I will never accept. That you love me more than I love you. Because my love for you, though unarticulated, will never be equal. If all goes well, I should be back in my cell before sundown. Should I be detained? Do not rush to get home. Take your time and enjoy a side trip to Europe with the girls. I'll try to call you tonight if the authorities will allow me. Otherwise, just remember me in your dreams. Love, Ninoy. And when the plane came to that airport, it was taxi that gate 8. Military men from the Absecom went to the airport. They were searching for Ninoy. And uh, they found him. They touched his back. This is to check if he had bulletproof vest so that they know what to target. And uh, the, the soldier said, Boss, Pinapaimbita kayo. And then you know, he said, saan tayo pupunta? And they never answered. They just took him. And this is where you will see Ninoy's face from a smiling face. His face changes. And he probably knew he's going to die already. His, his, his brother-in-law was with him uh, and his brother-in-law instructed him 
that when they take him, they, uh, Ninoy should tell them that you are taking, you, you should also take my brother-in-law with him. When the brother-in-law said, I'm going with him, uh, uh, he, he, he said something like, you know, I'm going, Ninoy, I'm going with you. And then Ninoy just said, come on. And that was the last word that he said. And the Japanese told the uh, brother-in-law, just take seat. So he was not allowed. And from then they escorted him out to the play, out to the tarmac. And then they shot him in the head, near the ears, and the bullet came out of the chin. And they also killed someone who became what we call the fall guy, Rolando Galman. They brought him to the Absicom van, and it, he was found there a few hours later. He was wearing the rosary, uh, and uh, yeah. The mother of Ninoy said, oh, this is Cory Aquino looking at Ninoy after he she heard that her husband was killed. And the mother of Ninoy, Doña Aurora, said, do not clean the body. I want them to see what they did to my son. And so, thousands of Filipinos skewed to see Ninoy's body. I'm sorry, trigger warning. And this is what they saw. They, Filipinos, the Filipinos now equaled Ninoy's martyrdom to those of our national heroes and they even likened Jose Rizal to Ninoy Aquino. This was an instant recognition that the people finally found, found Ninoy a courageous man to face his enemies, to face death, for a noble cause, which is reminiscent of Ninoy's favorite song, The Impossible Dream, which says, this is my quest to follow that star, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to fight for the right without question or force, to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if I'll only be true to this glorious quest that one man will lie peaceful and calm when he when I'm laid to my rest, and the world will be better for this, that one man, scorned and covered with scars, still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable star. Ninoy became the symbol of all the other victims of martial law, men, women, and young people. He was brought to Tarlac for the last time in his hometown Concepcion and also in his uh, capital town Tarlac, Tarlac Tarlac, where I came from. He says here, Ninoy, in Kapampangan language, you are loved by all your tabalen or your Townmates, and this is in Tablac, and eventually on, his on this funeral, Ninoy was brought by two million people to his final resting place in Manila Memorial Park. Ninoy Aquino's courage became the courage that infected his countrymen to also fight for their rights, and this movement eventually led to the People Power Revolution at EDSA, where we showed bayanihan, pakikipagkapwa tao to each other, despite the fact that we are not in agreement with each other, where we showed the world and we told ourselves, why are we killing each other? Pare-pareho tayong magkababayan. That bayanihan led to the ouster of Marcos, and eventually, of course, that revolution 
was copied all around the world. And it was the image of Ninoy that they brought around as an inspiration. The people power movement of the Philippines inspired other countries to also fight for their rights. And this is a one country's tribute to a man that showed them how to be brave. Ninoy Aquino said, we should have faith in our people and faith in our God. And when he was asked, what is the country's greatest resource? And he said it was the Filipino people. The Filipino people because he is worth fighting for. Sorry, not worth fighting for, worth dying for. And so there it was. The story of Senator Aquino and Marshall Law, how he became the light in the dark night of the dictatorship. Marami pong salamat at mabuhay tayong lahat.